Isaiah chapter number 54. Tonight we're going to be considering the life of William Carey. And I'm going to read the text for you tonight that was the text for his most famous sermon. That is beginning in verse number 2 of Isaiah chapter 54. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the, con- the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and, on, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin tonight. Father, we pray that, uh, Lord, that you'd help us tonight, help me tonight. Uh, we've got a lot of information to give uh, this evening. It's going to be very difficult to remember it all. And I pray for your guidance. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, remembrance of everything that you want me to say. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be careful tonight, not to glorify William Carey unnecessarily, but Lord, to, uh, to use him as an example of what you can do with us if we commit ourselves uh, to you. We ask that you would receive the glory through this service tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me shed my coat. It's not something I normally do, but it's a little toasty in here this evening. One of the dangers uh, that we run into when we do something of this sort is, honestly, it's idolatry. It's making too much uh, of the man. Um, and, and I want to be careful not to do that tonight. When you think of a man like William Carey, William Carey was a Baptist missionary. And we hold him in great esteem because of that. He was the father of modern, modern missions. Uh, but I would submit to you that if William Carey was alive today, we would not allow him to come into this building tonight. Uh, William Carey was not just a Baptist. <laughs> Uh, Along with being a Baptist, he was a Calvinist, and he was a staunch Calvinist at that. Along with that, he was a post-millennialist. And and there are some things that that I I think that he did on the field that uh, that I probably would not agree with. Uh, He is a little little too ecumenical for my taste, Uh, but but I'm I'm not trying to be too critical of him there because it's it's easy to be critical um, of of the lonely missionary. And when anyone professing Christ comes along, you know, he's hungry for fellowship. And that's exactly what he was looking for. So I, I, I want to get that out of the way. William Carey was not a perfect man. Uh, he had a lot of faults. Uh, if William Carey was today, we probably wouldn't support him. We, we, we wouldn't. But, uh, but I, I find that fascinating because, um, you know, we, we look at Calvinists today and... Uh, and, and we, don't, we don't really like him that much, to, to be honest. And um, I don't think we would like William Carey that much. But nevertheless, God used him in a tremendous, tremendous way. Uh, and and, and that's, um, that's the glory to God, that God can use imperfect people. Most of you, I, I find it a little bit ironic that here we are on a Missionaries You Should Know uh, study. We're beginning with William Carey. And if everybody in here does not know who William Carey is, almost everyone certainly does. Uh, William Carey, as you know, is the father of modern missions. Uh, You probably know the quote that is uh, given to William Carey, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. He is misquoted there, but uh, but nonetheless. Uh, And and, and we also know that William Carey was a missionary uh, to India. I think all of us, if not all of us, almost all of us know that. But nevertheless, I think most of us are not that familiar with anything more than that in the life of William Carey. So I do think it's appropriate for us to take the father of modern missions and become more familiar with him. William Carey was born in 1761 in Northamptonshire, England, in the village of Pollersbury to Edmund and Elizabeth Carey. The Careys were faithful to the Anglican Church or the Church of England. Uh, William's formal education stopped at the age of 12. But his learning, his desire for learning, uh, went well beyond that. And uh, his, the fact that his formal education stopped when he was 12 was no obstacle uh, for his ap- appetite for learning. He developed a great appetite for history, for science in particular, uh, and, and in more particular, a study of plants. Uh, and he would carry that, uh, that particular desire, botany, uh, the study of botany, for, with him for the rest of his life. He would make great contributions to the nation of India through, through botany. He also began at an early age to, to develop a desire for adventure. Uh, the notable adventurer of that day was James Cook. Uh, James Cook, the, one of the greatest explorers in world history. Uh, he, he was the man that, that discovered most of the South Sea Islands. 
And Cook's first voyage took place in 1768, 1771, uh, which, which means that at the end of his first voyage, uh, William Carey was 10 years old, and the news of that voyage traveled very, very quickly. And so as Carey developed, he developed a, a desire for world adventure. In 1775, when William Carey was 14 years old, his father shipped him off to a nearby village uh, to apprentice with a man by the name of Clark Nichols as a shoemaker in the village of Piddington. Clark Nichols was also a member of the Anglican Church, just like William's family was. But Clark Nichols was not as faithful to the Anglican Church as uh, the Careys were. Uh, Clark Nichols' testimony betrayed him. Uh, he was a drunk, he was a short-tempered man. And it seems like Nichols' behavior was pushing uh, William Carey away from Christianity, or any semblance of Christianity for that matter. But at the same time, a man about three years older than William Carey, by the name of John War, uh, was also apprenticing with Clark Nichols. And John War was not an Anglican. John War was a dissenter, or a separatist. Uh, and he did not acknowledge the authority of the Anglican Church. Now, there was a great deal of animosity. If you know anything about uh, the dissenters of the separatists, you know there was a great deal of animosity between those who were loyal to the Anglican Church and the dissenters. And the hatred uh, was not lost on William towards John War. He, he truly did hate John War. Uh, but John War began to slowly work on him. And over a few years, John War led William to the Lord. At age 17 and a half, William Carey got saved. And with salvation, Carey immediately began, uh, became interested in, in the scriptures. His master, Clark Nichols, had some commentaries, uh, some of which were written in Greek, and that was no obstacle for, for Carey. Carey decided he would learn Greek so that he could read the commentaries. Uh, not only with that, he, he also learned uh, Latin and Hebrew so that he could read the scriptures in the original languages. Shortly after his conversion, he fell in love at the age of 19 to a, a young lady by the name of Dorothy Plackett. And in June of 1781, William and Dorothy were married. Now, Dorothy was illiterate, and as William Carey developed a passion for global missions, this passion was not shared by Dorothy. Within the first two years of their marriage, William and Dorothy had a, da a daughter named Anne, but it wasn't long after she, she was born that, uh, that Anne passed away. It was also during this time that, that uh, William uh, had a, a serious bout with a fever, a persistent fever for 18 months, and that is where he developed the baldness uh, that we all know uh, as William Carey. But by the age of 22, he was as bald as you see in the picture. Uh, shortly after William's marriage, he heard a message by the name of John Horsey. John Horsey was preaching on baptism. But John Horsey was a pedo-baptist, which means he believed in infant baptism. And this sermon was not that convincing to William, and it caused William to go to the scriptures and to uh, learn what, what, he, what the New Testament taught about uh, baptism. And he came to the conclusion uh, that, that he was to be a credo-baptist, or a be believer's baptism. Uh, and so he became a baptist, not only a dissenter, but a baptist, which, you know, baptist on the rung of dissenters is way down the, uh, uh, down, down the totem pole. So in, 18, in 1783, William Carey was baptized by John Ryland. It was around this time that global missions began to intrigue William Carey. Uh, by this time, James Cook had actually completed all three of his voyages, having died on the final vo voyage. And the travel records became available to William Carey. Except this time, uh, when he read, the, he read of the stories and the voyages of, of, uh, of, of James Cook, he was not intrigued by the adventure. He was, uh, he, he was demoralized by the misery, the sinfulness, uh, the total debauchery of the natives of the South Sea Islands. Along with James Cook's voyage records, he also began to read uh, the story of David Brainerd, uh, the missionary to the American Indians, who, who died after three years of ministry there. Also, he began to read of John Elliot, not, John, or, uh, yeah, not, not um, Jim Elliot, John Elliot, who was also a missionary to the American Indians. And John Eliot is the one that translated the scriptures into their native language, and that, of course, made a profound impact on William Carey. In 1985, Carey moved, to his, moved his family to Moulton, England, and he was asked to be a pastor there. Uh, so he began to seek out a sponsorship for a, from another church so that he could pastor, 
uh, with some authority. And so he was asked to go to this larger church, much larger church, several hundred in that church, and he would preach there, and then they would judge his, uh, his gifts, so to speak. Uh, when he did preach the first time, he was rejected. They, they did not accept his preaching. His gifts were not, were not good enough for them. So a year later, when he tried again, the second time, uh, I, I quote, this, this is what they said about his second attempt. I quote, it was as weak and crude as anything ever called a sermon. Uh, but nonetheless, they accepted him, and they allowed him uh, to, be, to become the pastor. Uh, so in 1787, he became the pastor, but the church was so poor in Moulton that he had, to, uh, he had to open up his own leather shop, his own shoe factory or shoe, shoe shop, and also he had to teach at a school to make ends meet. That was no obstacle. Within a year, they were rebuilding. The church had expanded uh, because of William Carey's leadership. And along with pastoring came the opportunity to participate in what were pastoral meetings or pastoral associations. Uh, the pastors in a particular region of a particular faith would meet together uh, on, a, on a regular basis throughout the year at different locations. And they would discuss different things. They would discuss different topics. They would discuss, discuss different texts. And William Carey was a part of what became known as the Northampton Association. Now, I need to give you a little context here. Um, when we talk about Baptists in that day, there were particular Baptists and there were general Baptists. Particular Baptists believe in limited, aton uh, limited atonement. They are Calvinists. And general Baptists believe in uh, in, in Christ dying for all, that, that Christ's sacrifice is available to all. And William Carey, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, William Carey was a particular Baptist. He was a strong particular Baptist. Uh, and, and Calvinism, I, I, I hesitate to say this, but you know, we oftentimes think of Calvinism as an enemy of the gospel. And in a certain way, I would agree with that, but I would also like to remind you that the father of modern missions was a Calvinist. So Calvinism must not be that much of an obstacle because here's a Calvinist who has done way more uh, than many non-Calvinists that I know of. What is an enemy of soul winning is hyper-Calvinism, which was the dominant uh, thinking of that day. William Carey was not a hyper-Calvinist. He was merely a, a, a Calvinist. Uh, but, uh, but he did deal with some obstacles by the hyper-Calvinists of that day, and some of which were in that Northampton Association. So we come back to this, uh, this meeting that, um, uh, that, that well, well, let me explain this one thing as well. One of the ways that they, they, they got around the obligation of the gospel was they took the Great Commission, uh, they took the Church of Pentecost, and they said that because the Church of Pentecost was, uh, was given the gift of tongues, and that gift went away, uh, they were at least cessationists, that, that, that in order for the, the, for the gospel, the, the Great Commission, to apply today, for us to have to preach the gospel, the gift of tongues must, apply, uh, must, must be given to us as well. So that's how they got past uh, the Great Commission, which seems rather obvious to me that it is given to us. And so when you come to this first meeting, William Carey is given the floor. He is given an opportunity to present a topic that these preachers, these pastors, would discuss. And William Carey, William Carey's first topic was whether the command given to the apostles to teach all nations was not binding on all succeeding ministers to the end of the world, seeing the accompanying promise was of equal extent. And the promise that he's speaking of there is the promise of Matthew 28, where, where Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth, or even unto the end of the world. Now, out of that meeting comes the famous quote, which many of you are going to be familiar with, given by John Ryland. John Ryland, in response allegedly in response to William Carey proposing this topic, said, sit down, young man, sit down and be still. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without consulting either you and me. Uh, now, you can sense a little bit, a little bit of hyper-Calvinism there, can't you? Now, it's unlikely that he actually said that. Uh, in fact, it's extremely unlikely that he, that he actually said that. But, but nevertheless, you get the sentiment that they had. They were not particularly zealous about winning the heathen to the Lord. And so they did dismiss the topic from the meeting, but the topic was not dismissed from William Carey's mind. He continued to meditate on that. In the next year, William Carey took the navigational maps of James Cook. Uh, he took some other maps that he had possessed already, and he began to draw his own maps 
of the world and of the discovered world. As one author put it, his globe was his other Bible. And he was still teaching school at this time. And it, it is said that when he, oftentimes when he was teaching the geography class, that he would begin to cry as he, were, uh, as he began to point out the new discovered regions. And, and he, would, he would say to his students, these, th these are pagans, pagans. So you can see a desire for global missions in William Carey uh, even then. In 1789, William Carey relocated his family to uh, Leicester, England to take a church there of about 60 people. And the church that he took there was a disaster spiritually. Uh, and, and it was such a disaster that William Carey moved to uh, basically end the church and restart the church. And all uh, new members that would join the church would agree to a new covenant. Uh, and, and basically what it was, a church split. I mean, they had members that left the church that were fierce enemies of the church afterward. Uh, but, but after the church split, the church began to, to grow. And it was during this time that William Carey was pastor in, uh, in, in Leicester, England, that, uh, that he also went out in the neighboring villages and planted what was the foundation of five other churches that would be later established. Now we come to the year 1792. 1792 is probably the most pivotal moment or pivotal year of William Carey's life besides the year of his conversion. In 1792, there were two things that William Carey did. The first of which is he wrote a pamphlet, uh, which came, became known as Carey's Inquiry. Uh, and the second thing that he did was he preached a particular message from the text that we read uh, this evening. The, the pamphlet that William Carey wrote, um, as I said, it was called Carey's Inquiry, but the succinct title of this pamphlet is An Inquiry in the Obligations of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. A very succinct title. Uh, this book would not be a bestseller today. You wouldn't read it. In fact, I, I would challenge all of you to go read it. It's like 90 pages. Uh, but I, I, I am betting that many of you will not. Uh, because, because you understand that we are under the obligation to, to reach the loss. But this book at, in 1792 was quite a controversial book. William Carey was considered to be a radical thinker uh, because of his thoughts regarding global missions. And the book gives us a little bit of insight into, one, William Carey's passion, his passion towards global missions, but also it gives us a little bit of insight into William Carey's personality, uh, something that we really don't get much of, but we get in, 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 in the book. In the book, Carey proclaims the relevancy of the Great Commission in that day uh, to Christians all around the world. And he answered any objections to that, uh, that proclamation uh, with Scripture. There's a section in the book, it's, it's, it's written in five sections. The second section is, is, is where he details the history of missionary movements beginning in the book of Acts. The third section is, is, is a survey of the world that William Carey knew. In this survey, he details the size, the population, and the religion of the nations that William Carey knew of. And in concluding this section, Carey writes these words that I couldn't help when I read the words cast in our current day. He wrote this, I quote, It must undoubtedly strike every considerate mind what a vast proportion of the sons of Adam there are, who yet remain in the most deplorable state of heathen darkness, without any means of knowing the true God except what are afforded them by the works of nature. And utterly destitute of the knowledge of the gospel of Christ, or of any means of obtaining it. In many of these countries, they have no written language, consequently no Bible, and are only led by the most childish customs and traditions. And I say to that, at least they didn't believe the Great Commission applied to them. What is our excuse? We know that the Great Commission applies to us, and yet, when I read that, uh, that uh, uh, summary of the state of the world, as far as Christianity is concerned, it's as bleak as it is today. There are many in the world that have never heard the name of Jesus. There are many in the world that do not have the scriptures translated into their language. And I ask, what is our excuse? The fourth section of this book was a response to five practical objections to going to reach the heathen. And it's here we get a sense of Carey's, his dedication to the cause, his ultimate consecration. He writes this, a Christian minister is a person who in a, who in a peculiar sense is not his own. He is a servant of God and therefore ought to be wholly devoted to Him. He engages to go where God pleases and to do or endure what He sees fit to command or call Him to in the exercise of His function. 
He virtually bids farewell to friends, pleasures, and comforts, and stands in readiness to endure the greatest sufferings in the work of his Lord and Master. He was consecrated to the cause. And I think we, we can learn at least this from William Carey, that we should be equally as consecrated to the cause. Then in the final section of Carey's book, he proposes action. He proposes, first of all, uh, prayer. prayer. Uh, and then he proposes that they form a society whereby they could give and choose men to go and to reach the heathens. The second thing that happened in 1792 was a sermon that William Carey preached from, 50, uh, from Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3. And the message was all about the possibility of the church to, to expand their tent, to enlarge the place of thy tent, and to let them stretch forth uh, despite their previous failings to do so. Uh, and it is in this sermon that the famous quote, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Now that's misquoted because what he actually said was in reverse order, expect great things from God, or he didn't even, didn't even include from God. It was expect great things, attempt great things. Exce expect great things and attempt great things. And the order to carry was very important. Evangelism was the fruit of faith, not the other way around. And this sermon was the launching pad for the Baptist Mission Society that was formed at their next pastor's uh, association meeting. And you might think, you might be, might be tempted to think that this is, this is great. Churches banding together to reach the world with the gospel. But if you were there in that day, you, you would not have been as excited. Uh, the prospects of this small mission society were, uh, that, well, they were all poor, they were all very, very small churches. Uh, some of them were barely hanging on. Uh, and, 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 and to be quite frank, if you were to assess the situation, you wouldn't say that that Baptist Mission Society was going to be able to do a whole lot for Jesus Christ. Before this time, missions was usually an extension of the government. Uh, you think about the Puritans, you think about Wesley, you think about Brainerd, uh, and many others had built their plans on funding from the government. Uh, even the Moravians had a centralized government and, and a united denomination. But the mandate of missions, as we know, is given to the church. It's given to the church. So this is really one of the first times that a handful of churches gets together to fulfill the Great Commission as they have been commanded to do. Now, Carey's intentions was to go to Tahiti, the island of Tahiti, which was an island that had been discovered by James Cook uh, uh, just, just recently. But shortly after they started the association, a man by the name of John Thomas was introduced to the association. John Thomas was a physician. He had already been to India, to Bengal, um, and, and, and he, he was a missionary of sorts while he was over there. And so it seemed great to the, the association that William Carey uh, and John Thomas would go together. John Thomas would be William Carey's associate in Bengal or India. Now, not everyone was as excited as William Carey was that William Carey was going to the mission field. Uh, when William Carey wrote to his father of his new calling, his father said it was the folly of one man. And worse yet, Carey's wife was not on board with the idea. Uh, the plan was for William Carey to go to India for four or five years and then come back to England, pick up his wife, pick up the rest of his family, uh, and take them to India. But at last, right before they got on the ship, Dorothy, his wife, decided to go to uh, go with him to India. And on June 13, 1793, William Carey and his family, John Thomas and his, set sail for India. They landed five months later uh, on November 11th of that same year. And Carey would never set foot in England again. He'd be in India the rest of his life, but his I influence in England lived well beyond his time in England. I, now, I don't have time to spend a whole lot of, I don't, I don't have much time to spend a lot of time on the political, political situation in England and India. But suffice to say, the political situation in India was not conducive to missionaries. Uh, there was a tense struggle. I, I've got to lay a little bit of foundation where I'll move on very, very quickly. Uh, there was a tense struggle between the Dutch settlers and the English settlers in India. In fact, there were four wars fought over India. Uh, amongst the, the Dutch and the, the English, called the Anglo-Dutch Wars. The fourth of which took place in the 1780s, which it ended nine years before William Carey landed in India. Uh, 
but when, it, when Kerry arrived in India, the tensions had not ceased. There were still some tensions between the Dutch and the English. Furthermore, England didn't really want missionaries in India. They believed that missionaries coming to India would, uh, would cause the, the natives to rebel against England. Uh, and and, and in, in, in fact, Kerry and Thomas, when they arrived, they arrived on a Dutch ship. And they weren't actually supposed to be in India. They didn't go over there legally. Uh, they weren't given any problems because, after all, what are two men going to do? As you will see, they will do a lot. But the English government was not concerned with it. But the English government does become a problem at a later date when more missionaries uh, come to town. So the, the greatest early trial of, uh, this is an amusing story, but I'm sure it was not amusing to William Carey. The, the greatest trial that William Carey had to deal with in his first year as missionary was, uh, was brought on by John Thomas, his, his helper. See, when the association had estimated all of their necessary costs, they did so based on the word of John Thomas. John Thomas had been in Bengal before he had he, he kind of had an idea of what the expenses in India would be. And so, so John Thomas, they, they based their expenses on John Thomas's work. Now, you've got to remember, they didn't have a Western Union. Okay? They sent the first year's worth of expenses with William and John uh, on, the, on the boat ride over there. Now, John Thomas was a great man. He was a good missionary. He was a good physician. But he was not good with money. Uh, he was not good at estimating costs, apparently. Because within three months of John Thomas and William Carey arriving, John Thomas let William Carey know that their entire uh, purse was gone. And John Thomas had underestimated their expenses, but he had also uh, he had acted as if though he had estimate, overestimated their expenses. So in three months, William Carey has a family of seven to take care of, and he has no money. And he is in a place where he really doesn't know the language that well. It's a great situation, great situation for pioneer missionaries. Along with that, his wife was dealing with dysentery, so was his oldest son, uh, Felix. And in fact, his wife never recovered from this. Um, his wife, I, I believe she, she had a mental breakdown, almost certainly had a mental breakdown. And, and I, I, I struggle to be critical of Dorothy Carey, because as you know, the, the path of the pioneer missionary in particular is extremely difficult. The cost is extremely high. And Dorothy, Dorothy Carey paid that cost. Uh, she had a mental breakdown. And, and as she went on later in her life, beca she became more mean-spirited. Um, she accused William Carey multiple times of infidelity in their marriage. She even tried to kill William Carey a couple of times. She, she, she basically went insane. Uh, despite this, William Carey was faithful to his wife. He took care of her until the day that she died. Again, I, I don't want to paint Dorothy Carey in, in a negative light. I, she, she's paid a higher cost for Christ than I have, uh, and anybody else in here as well. So I'm not critical of Dorothy, Dorothy Carey. Shortly after uh, they, they arrived there, the Lord opened a position for William Carey as a manager of an indigo factory in a, called, in a town called Munabati. I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation, but not nevertheless. And there in that town, he, he, he earned a nice salary as the manager of the Hindico factory. But that's not exactly what you expect a pioneer missionary to do. It's working in an indigo factory. But he really obviously had no choice but to accept the position. And it was shortly after he took that position that his five-year-old son, Peter, passed away of a fever. Uh, as, as, as I said, the, the sickness of Dorothy persisted uh, uh, for quite a while. William himself. Uh, got sick as winter came on. And in William Carey's journals, we have these, these entries in the following winter, February 3rd, 1795. He writes this, Oh, what I would give for a sympathetic friend to whom I might open my heart. But God is here, who not only has compassion, but can save to the uttermost. He writes on March 14th, a month later, he said, Mine is a lonesome life. And to add insult to injury, for well over a year, William Carey never received any letters from, from England. It wasn't that they were, weren't being written, but that he didn't, he didn't get them. And what good are our letters if the missionary doesn't, doesn't get them, doesn't receive them? If, and so, not only that, 
when he did get the letters from the society back, they were critical of him taking a position in the indigo factory. They couldn't understand why their missionary was working a full-time secular job instead of doing the work of, of the ministry. So Kerry not only, uh, when he did get the letters, he had to defend himself to the society. A depressing, lonesome journey. Although Kerry was not just working a secular job, he was learning the language, uh, he was uh, learning the culture, he was preaching when opportunities afforded, uh, and he was very clear with the natives about his intentions to, to win them to Christ. And he had even begun translating the scriptures into the Bengali language. The structure of his schedule as a manager of that factory allowed him uh, for three months of the year, November to February, to, to, to really have free reign with his schedule. And that was his opportunity. And so during those winter months, he would travel to about half of the 200 neighboring villages around uh, Moon Nabate, and he would preach to those. He, he would oftentimes travel 20 miles a day during those three months, preaching the gospel to those neighboring village. This also allowed him to establish a work right there in Moon Nabate, uh, and oftentimes he would have as many as 500 people come to Moon Nabate on Sundays to hear him, hear him preach. In late 1796, William Carey had a, a new missionary join him by the name of Jonathan Fountain. Jonathan Fountain was a great encouragement to Carey. And by the spring of 19, or 1797, Thomas and Carey had translated the New Testament into Bengali. He had also began learning a couple more languages at that time. And it was about that time that the owner of the factory, who was a Christian, decided to buy William Carey a printing press so that he could begin to print the New Testament that he had translated. Despite these small victories, uh, the ministry was not really fruitful as far as souls is concerned. He didn't have any converts uh, at, at that point, or at least native converts at that point. Uh, he wrote of himself in a depressing way. He said, if God used me, none need despair, none need despair, implying that God can certainly use anyone if he used Carrie. Kerry was dealing with a culture that, that caused great societal pain to anyone that accepted Jesus Christ. And much plowing was needed, much sowing was needed to remo remove the strongholds of Satan in that culture. Uh, one such demonstration of the strongholds of Satan in that culture was what they called widow burnings. And Kerry, he, he witnessed his first widow burning in 1799. Uh, where they burned the widow of the recently deceased husband on top of the body of the, uh, the recently deceased husband. Uh, and this was supposedly voluntarily, but of course, uh, in practice, practice it was not. Uh, and Kerry did everything he could to stop this particular wid widow burning, but he left that. He, he was not successful. Uh, but he left that determined to, to put an end uh, to the widow burnings in India. It took him 30 years but he was able to do, the, do so after 30 years. We go to the end of 1799 and help arrives in India again. The Wards, the Marshmans, the Brunsons, and the Grants all arrived as missionary help. And except the size of, of, of the party and the fact that now there was a missionary team already on the ground that is proving that they're gonna be persistent in India, uh, it, is, it is during this time that the English government decides to give the missionaries some trouble. They would not let these new missionaries into, into their part of India. Providentially, the Danish government, uh, the Danish governor of Serampore, allowed them in. And he wanted them, he didn't just allow them in, he wanted them to come and establish a church there in Serampore. So because of the circumstances, Kerry relocated to Serampore. Uh, he left his indigo factory in Munabate in 1800. Uh, and it's at this time in 1800 that Kerry had completed almost, except for a few chapters, the entire Bengali language uh, in, in about five and a half years. And it's this move, it's this move to Serampore uh, that is the turning point for William Carey's life. Up to this point, he had not had any converts, uh, at least native converts. Uh, and now he had a team. Now, it was very shortly after the team arrived that the team began to dwindle. They began to die. Uh, Fountain, Jonathan Fountain, Brunson died, both very gifted men. What eventually became the team uh, is known in history as the Serampore Trio. Now, we know William Carey, but, but the Serampore Trio of William Carey, William Ward, and Jonathan Marshman 
as well as their respective wives, had a tremendous impact on the nation of India. India. And it wasn't just William Carey. It was William Ward and Jonathan Marshman. We begin to see the impact of teamwork. When you add one plus one, the, the outcome in missionary work is not two. It is greater than two. And when you add one plus one plus one, the outcome is definitely not three. They can do much greater than three people's work by working, working together. And so it is no coincidence that Kerry's most successful years are when he is accompanied by William Ward and Jonathan Marshman. As you know, when you work with a team, it requires different skill sets, but it requires the same frame of mind. You have to be of the same objective. And William Ward and Jonathan Marshman were of the exact same mind as William Carey. Uh, and their skill sets differed enough that they were complementary. Uh, William Carey was, of course, the translator. William Ward was a commercial printer back in England, so when he went over to India, it was a natural fit for him to be the printer. And Jonathan Marshman was, uh, by many accounts, the best preacher of the three. So these two three fit together complementary as far as their skills was concerned. And their mind to work, to the work of the ministry was, uh, in, in my opinion, as far as a team, was unprecedented. Um, they agreed that, that, that none of them would do any work for personal gain. That if any of them did any work that brought in extra income, they would give that entirely to the mission, and then the mission would distribute according to the needs. So really what you have here, and I'm going to call it a, a big no-no term, but what you have here is, is democratic socialism. I mean, you, you have three guys, you know, they're contributing according to their ability, and they are being distributed to according to their need. Uh, that's, that's pretty much socialism. But it, it, it worked. It worked for them. And it worked because none of them had an ego. Uh, they, they were perfectly content with that. They didn't want the credit for the work. They just wanted work to get done. Um, they, they agreed that the translation and the printing of the translation was the most critical work of their ministry. So William Carey began to translate even more. William Ward began to arrange the, uh, the details of the printing. And Jonathan Marshman established a boarding school for the European students in the area. Uh, and, and that school was to bring in income uh, for, uh, for the printing of the scriptures. So you see how it all worked together. It was a tremendous team. It was a tremendous team. And I dare say that William Carey's impact, his influence, and what we remember as William Carey would not be the same if it was not, the, not without the teamwork of Carey, Ward, and, uh, and, and, and Marshman. Finally, you come to late 1800. William Carey is preaching three times a day uh, in the highways there in Serampore, four times a day when it's cool outside. And in late 1800, they have their first native con uh, uh, convert named Krishna Paul. With him, the same day, three other converts professed faith in Jesus Christ. But before those four converts could be baptized, they were harassed. They were, they were tortured. Krishna was thrown into prison. Uh, his family members that trusted Christ were, were threatened. And when it came time to be baptized, the only one that was willing to be baptized was Krishna. Uh, and Krishna was baptized. He went home. And at the end of that baptism, the three others decided they wanted to be baptized as well. Uh, Krishna would eventually become a great evangel evangelist in India. And from there, their work began to flourish. And in 1802, they led their first Muslim to Christ. Also, they led their first Brahmin to Christ, a great feat. There was one, one man in particular, uh, Pitimbar, I guess. He was 60 years old who lived 30 miles away in, in an, another city. He found a pamphlet about Christ, and he responded to the, Christ, this is, to, to the pamphlet, this is what I've been seeking. And so he found the address on the, uh, the, the pamphlet, and he traveled 30 miles so that he could be con converted that, that very day. But as I have alluded to with Salvation Society treated uh, these, new, these new believers very cruelly. Uh, they said, soon found themselves without a place to live. Traitors would not do business with them. Some were killed, some were tortured. Uh, but still the work moved on, and uh, as the work added believers to its, uh, to its role. It had to take care of a lot of those believers. So it's unlike, uh, unlike ministries that you would think of establishing churches that are self-supporting. The ministry, in a lot of ways, had to support the new believers because of the caste system, because of 
uh, because of the religious strongholds there in India. In the year of 1801, William Carey was given a, uh, a, an interesting opportunity to teach at a nearby college, Fort William College, an English university. Uh, Carey was, eventually he would, he would become professor, he would accept the position, he would be professor there for 30 years. Uh, he was one of the longest tenured, or I think he was the longest tenured professor there at that university in its existence. Uh, and and, and it, this enabled him, one, to receive a great salary from his professorship, which he donated all back to the mission. Uh, and, and this was a task that would take up nearly half of his week. Uh, half his week was applied to this prof professorship, but it added some protection to the group. As I noted earlier, the British government was not friendly to the missionaries, and it wouldn't necessarily be friendly going forward, but it did add some protection to Carey uh, and, and his fellow workers. Now, his, his work at this college cannot be overstated. Uh, from the standpoint of language, if I were to put, if I were to, uh, to give us an analogy, William Carey was to India what Noah Webster was to, to America. He produced six books of grammar for different languages during his time there. He compiled three dictionaries, included, including his Bengali dictionary, which was three volumes long and had 80,000 words in it. But as it turns out, his greatest opportunity that, that was given to him by his professorship at Fort William was, uh, was spiritual in nature. Uh, I, I like to think of, of the story of Moses when he was an infant. Uh, he was put into that ark. The ark was floated to, to the Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter rescued Moses. And then they, they got Moses' parents to watch over Moses and paid him a salary to watch over Moses. A wonderful miracle that, the God, that God worked uh, in Moses and his family's life. <coughs> this situation is very similar to that. Before this, this professor, professorship, Carey had the intentions and the desire to print the whole Bible into two languages there in India. After he accepted this professorship, he realized that he was actually capable of doing way, way more than two. Because he was now working at the college, he had access to, to pundits or teachers of of the other languages uh, that, that, that scattered around India. And so he was able to have access to learning of the languages. He, he is able to have access to the, to the teachers that would help him with the translation. And so because of his professorship, he worked there for 30 years, and because of that, William Carey was, was able to translate so much of the scriptures uh, into the native languages there. And I'll, I'll end by, by, by uh, telling you how many of the languages he was able to translate the scriptures into. He gives us a little bit of a glimpse into his daily schedule while he worked there at the Fort William College. And, and his routine will put just about all of us to shame. It's so fascinating that I, I, I have to share it with you tonight. We begin at 5.45 to 7 o'clock. He said uh, he get, got dressed, read a chapter of the Hebrew Bible devotions. From 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, family worship in Bengali with servants. Uh, he read Persian with a language teacher. He revised scripture proof in Hindi. Uh, breakfast, translated portion of Ramayana uh, from, from some language into English with the help of, uh, of some pundit. From 10 o'clock to 1.30, he had his classes. From 1.30 to 2 o'clock, he had dinner. From 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock, he revised proof, proof of a Jeremiah chapter in Bengali. He translated most of Matthew 8 into some language with, uh, uh, with the teacher's help. From 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, he had tea. He read a, another language, uh, which, which means he was learning two languages in one day with a teacher. Um, he, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, he prepared and preached an English sermon. I'm not sure how that's even possible. From 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock, he translated Ezekiel 11 into Bengali. He wrote a letter to John Ryland. He read a Greek Testament chapter, commended self to God. And then he adds this note in his diary, I have never more time in a day than this. And I just simply say, what are you doing for the Lord? A, a busy, busy man. Uh, his work ethic was, uh, was, was exemplary. The work continued on. In 1807, uh, William Carey's wife passed away, Dorothy. The next year, William married Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte would pass away in 1821, much later on. And William would marry, a later, uh, marry a, another lady named Grace. And the work of the ministry would continue to grow with the number of converts being the least impressive uh, thing about their ministry. By 1817, they had built a network of schools, free schools, 
for the, uh, the Indian students there, they're very poor, the lower part of the caste that could not afford school. And in 1817, they had 10,000 boys on their school rolls, and that doesn't even number the girls that they had. <clears throat> in that same year, 1817, they decided to start a college uh, that would be primarily for the training of young men for the ministry. But their time in Serampore was not without its trouble. In 1812, they had a print shop, a fire in their print shop. The print, the print shop, the, the presses in the shop were saved. Uh, a lot of the translation work was saved because it wasn't stored in the print shop. But everything else was destroyed in the fire. And, in, and William Carey, when he estimated uh, the loss, the loss in time from the fire, he estimated that it was over one year of hard labor uh, that was lost in that fire. As the mission grew, the demand for more missionaries grew, but the missionaries that came did not share the same Christian unity, the same desires that the Serampore trio had. Uh, so there was a, a split eventually amongst the movement, the, the, um, uh, the mission there in Serampore. Also, about this time, the, um, uh, the members of the home mission, uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the members there at the home base, John Ryland, Andrew Fuller, men like that, uh, they had all died off. And so a new generation of pastors had rose up. And this new generation of pastors wanted more control of the mission there in India. Uh, and the uh, Serampore Trio, of course, they're there. They, they know what needs to be done. They would not give the, uh, the control, so they had to defend themselves uh, to, the, to the, the home uh, part of the mission. Along with that came accusations that the Serampore Trio was enriching themselves through the ministry, which couldn't have been further from the truth. Still, much was done built on this foundation that was built in these early Serampore years. One of the things that I have found interesting was the relationship that William Carey had with his sons. Uh, a couple of his sons died, uh, but three of the four surviving sons of William Carey were, uh, would eventually become <clears throat> missionaries. By, by some accounts, William Carey, at least early on in his children's life, was a negligent father. However, God's grace um, was sufficient. And as I said, three of the four became missionaries. Felix, his oldest, went to Burma to assist with the work there before returning after they were forced to. Uh, Felix, his first wife died in childbirth. His second wife uh, and two children drowned uh, in, a, in an accident in a ship with Felix trying to, uh, to save them uh, in, that, in that drowning. That accident actually caused Felix to go wayward for a few years. Uh, he became a drunkard until he was restored and he went back to Serampore and worked with his father uh, for the rest of his father's life. William, the next surviving son, uh, eventually moved back to Mundumbate, which was where his father had started his ministry, Mundumbate, where he was then, uh, the, at the Indigo factory. And interestingly, Mundumbate was not a very safe place. In fact, um, when William Carey, the, the father, went to Mundumbate, it gave a record that in that, that district that William Carey lived, that there had been 12 people that had died because of tigers in the previous years. And just to add a little context, can you imagine if we had a record of 12 people dying by shark bites out in the, uh, out in the bay here? You wouldn't be going out there. Uh, that, that's, that's a pretty dangerous place. And, and the tigers were just one aspect of the danger. There were also armed robbers and gangs in the area. And so when William, his son, went to Mundabate and he figured out how dangerous it was, he decided that was not the place for him. So he's, he wrote his father, um, William Carey, and his, his father rebuked him. He wrote him back and said, There is much guilt in your fears, dear William. Mary and you will be a thousand times safer committing yourselves to God in the path of duty than neglecting duty to take care of yourselves. His youngest son, Jabez, was a pioneer missionary as well. He was a pioneer missionary to an island in Indonesia before he even turned 20 years old. And William Carey, the father, kept every letter that was written to him by his sons. He cherished his, his, his letters with his sons, but he was not overly protective of his sons. Uh, he did not hold on to them tightly. He wrote, to, he wrote of his son Felix in Burma, I would rather hear of Felix losing his life in the cause of the gospel than see him quit his station. I don't have the quote with me, but, but he wrote of his youngest son Jabez, I would rather him be a missionary 
than, than have some high post there, there in uh, Sarampore. He wanted his children to be missionaries. He considered that to be the highest honor uh, in the Christian life. But the greatest achievement of William Carey's life was undoubtedly his translation work. At the end of Carey's life, he had translated the entire Bible into six languages. Uh, in three other languages, he had translated at least the New Testament and half of the Old Testament. In 21 other languages, he had translated at least the New Testament. In five other languages, he completed portions of the New Testament. And honestly, that sounds like an impossible task. That is a lot of languages to translate the scripture portions into. But William Carey often said that after he mastered the first seven languages, the rest of them came easily. I think mastering seven languages is difficult in and of itself. But of course, William Carey was not the only person working on these translations. However, all of these translations went through William Carey. He, he knew the languages. He approved the translation. The only translations that the Sarampur uh, mission worked on that he did not involve himself with was the Chinese translation and the Burmese translation. It is not an exaggeration to say that in William Carey's lifetime he translated the scripture for everybody in, in India. I, I saw a map earlier, earlier of the languages that were spoken throughout the geography in India. If you look at the map, I, I, I'll see if I can find it. And if you'd like to know it, let me know. I'll, I'll find the source for you. Um, if you look at the map, there is not a place in India that is not covered. William Carey made it so that everybody in India that could read, could read the scriptures. It was a remarkable achievement. And, you know, we're, we're trying to preach the gospel, we're trying to reach the world with the gospel. The power of the gospel is vested in the Word of God. And how are we going to preach the gospel without the Word of God? So what he did was a remarkable, remarkable feat. So let me conclude the life of William Carey with just a few thoughts. Uh, in application. And, and there's so much that William Carey took in that, that it's really hard to narrow it down to just a few, a few thoughts. But let me just, just, give, you, just give you a couple. I, I think that, that one of the greatest achievements, certainly in the top two greatest achievements of William Carey's life, was his activism in England towards missions, his missions activism. It was getting them off their seats and doing something to reach the heathen. And the issues, of the, great, the issues that they faced in that day was issues of theology. The issues that we face today are much more practical in, in, in their, in their uh, nature. The apathy of that day, I believe, is still somewhat present today. And Carey Carithi, disrupted their passive lifestyles with a radical focus on global missions. And the question that I pose to you is, who among us is going to stand up with a radical focus on global missions that will get our eyes off the materialism of this world and will get our eyes on reaching the world with the gospel. I am under the belief that the Lord will not, will not call us to do something that we cannot achieve. And He has called us to preach the gospel to every living creature. We can't control the results, but we can preach the gospel to every creature. So who is going to take that burden and, and take that upon their shoulders to make sure that that is ever before us? William Carey was that day. We need a William Carey in the, same, in the same manner today to take on that same form of missions activism. Second, I think about William Carey's relationship to his children. Uh, not early on at least, but, but later on when he, he had no, uh, no desire to hold back his children for his own memory, for his own comfort's sake. He wanted his children to go abroad. He wanted his children to be missionaries. He wanted his children to die on the mission field. And I think sometimes we here in America actually have the exact opposite mentality. Our mentality is, Lord, do not call my children to the mission field. We actually will discourage our children from the mission field. And, and I, I do believe that goes on even in a great church like this. God forbid if I, if I actually discourage my children from going to the mission field. It ought to be, it, it is the greatest honor to have one of your children 
serve the Lord on the mission field, be an ambassador to the heathen. The third uh, thing that I think about was, uh, was what, what was the defining characteristic of William Carey? And I think he gives us the defining characteristic. He wrote this in a letter to his nephew. He said, if after my removal anyone should think it worth his while to write my life, I will give you a criterion for which you may judge its correctness. If he gives me credit for being a plotter, he will describe me justly. Anything beyond this will be too much. I can plot. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. To this I owe everything. And to that I say we need more plotters. We need more people that will put their hand to the plow and won't look back. We need more plotters. And finally, my concluding thought is of the Serampore Trio, that team that did a great work for God. And, and again, I, I echo what I said earlier, William Carey would not be remembered by us if it was not for William Ward and Jonathan Marshman serving alongside him. That teamwork, that teamwork. And in fact, that's the New Testament motto, is it not? Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Silas and John Mark went out as teams, as teams. But to bring it even further down to, to where we are, I, I ask, where's the next Serampore trio? Could God call young men out of this church to do a great work together uh, in, some, in some field where the gospel has not preached. So my challenge is to you, uh, we need more plotters. We need more people with perseverance. But we need people that will look to the mission field as not something for somebody else. But Lord, would you use me on the mission field? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd give us...